Today's speaker is Chen Gua. She is a PhD candidate in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's also a Chancellor's Fellow from the Royster Society of Fellows. Chen is doing her dissertation research with a focus on hepatic transporters and pharmacokinetic modeling. She has earned her bachelor's degree in pharmacy in 2010 and a master's degree in pharmacokinetics in 2013 from the China Pharmaceutical University. Chen, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to her to begin the presentation. Thank you, Susan, for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to present my work here today. Um, today, I will talk about a prediction of hepatic transporter mediated drug bioassay interactions. First, I will give some background introduction about hepatotoxicity due to bioassay accumulation and some challenges in studying drug bioassay interactions. And my study covers two parts. The first part is doing some cokinetic modeling of bioassay disposition, and I evaluated the impact of using total or unbound inhibitor concentration on the prediction results. And I can, con can conclude with a framework proposed to predict transporter mediated drug bioassay interactions. Before we get started, I would like to get to know more about your background. So if you can go to menti.com, uh, and we'll start a poll question. Um, the first question is, what is your area of expertise? Preclinical translational pharmacokinetics, clinical pharmacology, toxicology, or others? And you can start using the code and typing in your answer. Okay, so seems most of the audience are coming from clinical pharmacology and preclinical or translational pharmacokinetics. And we also have a few folks from toxicology. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next question for the interest of time. Um, which sector are you from? Academia, government, industry, or others? And I will give another 20 to 30 seconds for you to answer. So the majority of the audience are from the industry and some are from academia. And one last question. What attracted you to this webinar? Transporter research, liver toxicity and bioassays, modeling in vitro data, learning more about Phoenix modeling language, or others? So it looks like most of you are interested in learning uh, modeling in vitro data and learning more about Phoenix modeling language. Thank you all for the participation. So now we'll get started. Drug-induced liver injury or hepatotoxicity is a major reason for drug withdrawal from U.S. market, as shown by this analysis done about 10 years ago. A more recent analysis showed that among all the novel agents approved by FDA since 2012, about 30% of them have hepatotoxicity warnings in their drug label, and most of the indications are neoplasia, Viral, in viral infection and autoimmune conditions. So, hepatotoxicity is a major issue. 
One of the toxicity mechanisms is extensive hepatic accumulation of bile acids. Bile acids can be synthesized in the liver. Alternatively, the circulating bile acids in the blood can be taken up into the hepatocytes by uptake transporters such as NTCP and OATP. In addition, um, after getting into the hepatocytes, the bile acids can be effluxed back into the bloodstream through basolateral efflux transporters, MRP3, MRP4, or OSD alpha beta. Predominantly, bile acids will be excreted into the bile canaliculi through biliary transporter, BSAP. When these efflux routes are inhibited, bile acids will start accumulating in the liver and therefore leading to hepatotoxicity. Two classic examples are triglitazone, which was withdrawn from the U.S. market many years ago, and bosentan, which has received a black box warning. However, these two compounds turned out to be clean in pre-clean co-species such as rodents, partially because the uptake transporter, NTCP, is inhibited more potently in rodents than in human beings. Therefore, the hepatic accumulation of bile acids is less intense. Simultaneous inhibition of uptake transporters might explain why some inhibitors of the biliary transporter BSEP are not toxic, as shown by the circles here. However, some cholestatic compounds are not BSEP inhibitors. That means these compounds might be inhibiting other transporters and leading to cholestasis. And that brings to one of the major challenges in studying drug bi-acid interactions. Because of the interplay of multiple transporters, the net effect of inhibitor depends on the relative contribution of each transporter and the relative inhibitory potency against each transporter. Another challenge is the debate around which type of inhibitor concentration to use for the prediction. Should we use total or unbound inhibitor concentration in a cell, cytosol, or in the plasma? There's no consensus between the FDA and the EMA guidance regarding intestinal efflux transporter mediated drug interactions. The FDA recommends using total plasma CMAX or concentration in the gut, while EMA recommends using unbound plasma CMAX. For hepatic efflux transporters, cellular total concentration seems to be more relevant than plasma concentration, and it is relatively easy to measure. However, it includes not only the unbound drug shown by the yellow boxes here, but also the drug bound to intracellular proteins and sequestered into the subcellular organelles. In fact, only the unbound drug in the cytosol can interact with efflux transporters. However, this type of inhibitor concentration are not routinely measured because of the labor and resource intensive nature. And I would like to take a break now and ask you about what do you usually do in, in your practice? What type of inhibitor concentration do you usually measure in human hepatocytes when you are predicting transporter or CIP enzyme-mediated drug interactions. Do you measure cellular total concentration, cellular unbound concentration, cytosolic, concentra cytosolic total concentration, cytosolic unbound concentration, or you never measure concentration of inhibitor in hepatocytes? So it seems most of the time um, people don't measure concentration in hepatocytes and the cellular total concentration is most commonly measured as we expected. And I'm really excited to see that um, there are three answers where people use uh, cytosolic unbound concentration um, in the prediction of uh, transporter mediated drug interactions. Great, thank you very much for your participation.
And that brings to the objective of the study. The primary objective is to predict altered bioassay disposition in human hepatocytes due to inhibition of multiple transporters. And the secondary objective is to evaluate the prediction accuracy using different measures of inhibitor concentration, including total or unbound concentration in the cell or cytosol. In this study, we used sandwich-cultured human hepatocytes, SCHH, as the experimental system. We use SCHH because um, it is a physiologically relevant whole cell system with lots of in vivo-like properties. For example, proper expression and localization of multiple transporters make it a great tool to study the interplay of transporters. Besides, the regulatory machinery of SIP enzymes and transporters are well maintained. More importantly, functional bicanalicular network is well maintained, which makes it a great tool to study biliary excretion. By modifying the calcium in the incubation buffer, we can indirectly quantify biliary excretion of a substrate. In this experiment, we will do we have two sets of hepatocytes and we incubate them with calcium containing standard buffer or calcium free buffer simultaneously. And the presence of calcium by canalicular network is intact. So we can measure the amount of substrate in the cell plus bile. In the absence of calcium, the bicanalicular network is disrupted. And therefore, we can measure the amount of substrate in cell only. By calculating the difference between the two, we can estimate the amount of substrate excreted into the bicanalicular network. And good, good in vitro in vivo correlation has been shown both in rodents and in humans. There are more than 80, uh, there are more than 40 bioassay species in human body. So we use tarcholic acid, TCA, as the model bioassay in this study. We chose TCA because it is the most commonly used substrate for bioassay transporter studies. And it is a made common component of bioassay pool in different species. To differentiate between endogenous and exogenously added TCA, TCA, we used deuterium labeled TCA in this study. And the uptake, biliary, and bisolateral efflux transporters involved in TCA disposition are highlighted in the red circles. And we chose bosentan and talmisartan as the model inhibitors because they inhibit the majority of TCA transporters. Here's the workflow. First, we measure the TCA concentration in sandwich cultured human hepatocytes over time in the uptake and efflux study. And these time course data will be used as data input for a mechanistic pharmacokinetic model. Using this PK model, we can estimate clearance values of TCA, including uptake clearance, biliary clearance, and basolateral efflux clearance. And using these kinetic parameters, we can perform multicolor simulation and predict the effect of inhibitors on TCA disposition. And to evaluate the prediction results, we will compare the prediction with experimental observations. Let's look at the first step. We adopted the uptake and efflux protocol developed by previous graduate student in our group, Nathan Pfeiffer. In this study, we have two sets of hepatocytes pre-incubated with calcium containing and calcium free buffer. And then deuterium labeled TCA was added into the incubation system in the presence of 4% bovine serum albumin to initiate the uptake phase. The amount of TCA in cell plus bile and in cell were measured over time. Then the hepatocytes were washed briefly for one minute to remove TCA in the medium. And blank buffer were added into the incubation system to initiate the efflux phase. And in this phase, TCA in the cell will start fluxing out 
into the medium. And we also measure the concentration of TCA in the medium over time. Then this time course data will be put into this PK model, which was executed by using Phoenix when knowing version 6.3 and Phoenix modeling language. The previous study I mentioned were conducted in three hepatocytes using hepatocytes from three, hepat three individual donors, and data from the three individual donors were modeled individually. This is the model structure. In the presence of calcium, there are three compartments, the medium compartment, cell compartment, and bicanalicular compartment and they were connected by optic clearance, basal lateral efflux clearance, biliary clearance. In addition, there's a first order rate constant, K flux, that describes the release of content from bicanalicular network into the buffer due to contraction of the bicanalicular network. In absence of calcium, the bicanalicular compartment is gone. So there are only two compartments and the BV clearance goes directly into the buffer. Here is the Phoenix modeling language on code. Um, these equations describe the, the amount of TCA in medium, in cell, and in the bi compartment. I want to point out that in order to mimic the one minute wash between the uptake and the efflux phase, we added this K wash term which was turned on at the end of 20 minute uptake phase and was fixed at 10,000 to remove all the TCA in the medium. This is the rest of the code. We, in this case, we were estimating uptake clearance, basal lateral efflux clearance, and biliary clearance and K flux. And Cellular volume and the medium volume were fixed, and actually cellular volume was estimated based on the content of protein in each well. Here's the uh, modeling results. The solid and dashed lines represent predictions using the mean of parameter estimates from the three hepatocyte donors, and the solid and open circles represent the mean of observations from the three hepatocyte donors. And during the uptake phase, the amount of TCA in cell plus bile and in cell increased. And during the efflux phase, the amount of TCA in cell plus bile and in cell decreased. And this figure shows the overlay of prediction and observation for TCA in the medium. Again, solid uh, lines and uh, solid circles represent the amount of TCA in standard buffer, and the dashed lines and open circles represent the amount of TCA in calcium-free buffer. There was a slight overprediction um, of the TCA amount, partially because in the model structure, we assume the cell compartment is a homogeneous um, compartment. However, in reality, there was subcellular sequestration of bioacids in the cell and the vesicle mediated transport in the cell. So that might have led to the underprediction in our model. This table shows the parameter estimates for TCA from three dependent, independent donors. And the mean value of the parameter estimates are shown here. And the CV percentage here shows the inter individual variability. And you can see here, uptake clearance is the predominant clearance pathway. And biliary clearance is about threefold higher of basal lateral efflux clearance, which makes sense because most of the bioassays will be excreted into the bicanalicular network. And the mean value of these parameter estimates and associated variance were used to perform multi color simulation by assuming normal distribution around the clearance values. And the multi color simulation was performed using Berkeley Madonna. 
to predict the effect of inhibitor on um, bi-acid disposition. Each of these clearance values were um, decreased as a function of inhibitor concentration in IC50. For uptake clearance, um, the uptake clearance of TCA is mediated by NTCP and the OATP1B1. So uptake clearance decreased as a function of medium concentration of the inhibitor and IC50 against NTCP and OATP1B1. The biliary clearance of TCA is mediated by BSAP. Therefore, um, biliary clearance in presence of inhibitor is a function of cellular inhibitor concentration and IC50 against the BSAP. For basolateral efflux um, clearance, multiple transporters are involved, including MRP3, MRP4, and OSC alpha beta and the relative contribution of each transporter is unknown. So we actually used the IC50 against MRP3 and MRP4. Since the IC50 were close, the prediction results were similar. So here's the question. Which type of inhibit cellular inhibitor concentration should we use? And we're interested in that and seeing which type of inhibitor concentration gives more accurate prediction. So we actually measured Tomisartan concentration in different matrices, including total cellular concentration, unbound cellular concentration, total cytosolic concentration, and unbound cytosolic concentration. These unbound concentrations were estimated by multiplying the total concentration and unbound fraction. As highlighted by the red box here, the unbound, unbound Tomisartan in the cytosol accounts for only a very small fraction of the total amount in the whole cell lysate, about 4%. And similar for bosentin, the unbound bosentin in the cytosol only accounts for about 8% of the total amount. So we're curious whether this difference will lead to different, totally different prediction results. Another thing I want to point out is highlighted by the yellow box. Although tamisartan and bosentan were dosed at similar dose level, the total accumulation of tamisartan was much higher than bosentan, and that actually led to some interesting findings later on. The final step is to compare the simulation results with experimental observations. To study the effect of inhibitors on TCA disposition, with pre-incubated sandwich cultured human hepatocytes with inhibitor in the absence of calcium. And then uptake of TCA was done after 10 minute incubation. The magnitude of interaction is shown as the fourth change in TCA total cellular concentration, as shown by the red boxes here. So the fourth change of TCA total cellular concentration in the presence of Tommy Sutton was 0.9, and in the presence of bosentin, it's 0.88. So it's not a huge change. Simulation results using different type of inhibitor concentrations are shown in different columns. By using unbound concentration either in a cell or in a cytosol, the prediction results were close to the observations. The mean. Um, the mean um, of the simulation are shown here, and the 95% confidence interval was shown in the parentheses. It overlaps with a range. It overlaps with a range of experimental observations. However, if we use the total inhibitor concentration, we overestimated the effect of tomisartan on TCA total cellular um, accumulation. The estimated, the simulated fold change using total concentration is 1.3 versus 0.9 for Tomisartan. But for bosentin, whether we use total or unbound inhibitor concentration, the simulation results were similar. So it seems the importance of using unbound inhibitor concentration is different for Tomisartan and bosentin. 
now you might be you might have one question. We didn't see much diff, uh, we didn't see much fold change in TCA total cellular accumulation and the presence of inhibitors. Was it because the system was not sensitive to the effect of inhibitors? So we use this simulation results to explain why. In this simulation, uh, we showed the TCA total cellular accumulation over different incubation time. And the black line represents TCA concentration in the absence of inhibitors. Red, green, and blue lines represent simulated um, TCA concentration using total cellular telmisatan inhibit total cellular concentration of telmisatan, unbound cellular concentration of telmisatan, and the unbound cytosolic concentration of telmisatan. As you can see, after 10 minute incubation, which was when we took the experimental observations, the difference between um, the simulated TCA in the presence and the absence of inhibitor was very minor. But as we extended in the incubation time, the difference between the simulation results in the presence of inhibitor and in absence of inhibitor became much larger. Since we were mainly interested in TCA concentration in cell only, we, the incubation time was limited by 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, we cannot accurately quantify TCA concentration in the cell only because the bicanaliculi network will start forming, and what we are measuring is the amount of TCA in cell plus bio. And we're also interested in explaining why it was more important to use unbound inhibitor concentration to predict Tommy Sartan effect, while for Bosentan, it didn't matter whether we use total or unbound concentration. We noticed that this ratio um, showing the total cellular inhibitor concentration over IC50, this ratio was much higher for Tommy Sartan than Bosentan. And that provoked us to run a sensitivity analysis around this ratio. The y-axis shows the prediction, the predicted TCA fold change using total, cell, total inhibitor concentration versus unbound inhibitor concentration. And you can see the difference starts increasing as this ratio increased. Since Tommy Sartan um, since for Tommy Sutton, the total cellular inhibitor concentration over IC50 ratio was much larger. That's why the prediction results using total versus unbound inhibitor concentration was more obvious. But for Bosentan, the difference between the prediction results was similar. With that, we can conclude the altered hepatic disposition of TCA due to inhibition of multiple transporters by telmisartan was adequately predicted. And although unbound inhibitor concentration led to more accurate prediction results, sometimes it may not be necessary to measure. With additional simulation work, which was presented in a separate paper, and I will not cover it today, we proposed a framework to predict altered transporter, um, altered by assay disposition in hepatocytes due to transporter inhibition. First, we can conduct uptake and efflux study of by assays in sandwich cultured human hepatocytes in absence of inhibitor. And with mechanistic PK modeling, we can estimate the clearance values at baseline. In the presence of inhibitor, these clearance values will decrease as a function of inhibitor concentration and inhibitory potency. And which inhibitor concentration should we use to estimate biliary clearance and basolateral efflux clearance depends on this ratio. When the ratio between total cellular inhibitor concentration divided by IC50 was less than one, we can use total cellular inhibitor concentration to predict the clearance values. If this ratio is greater than one, we recommend using unbound inhibitor concentration in the cell to predict up, um, the basolateral efflux and the biliary clearance. 
after we get the estimated clearance in the presence of inhibitors, we can use these kinetic parameters to simulate altered disposition of victim by acids due to inhibition of multiple transporters. The findings uh, from this study have many implications. First, as we mentioned in the introduction, interpretation of IC50 against individual efflux transporter is tricky. Um, and the framework proposed here helped us to improve the interpretation of transporter inhibition data. We put the IC50 into the context of interplay among multiple transporters. In a, although TCA used in this study was not toxic by itself, the framework proposed by this study can be extended to study drug-drug interactions and drug-toxic biacid interactions, which has more important implications for drug safety. Since we noticed that although unbound inhibitor concentration always leads to good prediction results, it may not be necessary for certain inhibitors. And this information helped us to better allocate the time and resources needed for collecting unbound concentration data. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge people who helped me in this study. Um, my major advisor, Dr. Kim Brower, my dissertation committee members, Dr. Paul Watkins, Dr. Hugh Barton, Dr. Yangguang Tao, and Dr. Daniel Gonzalez. And I would like to thank Satara for giving me this opportunity to present my work here, and also would like to thank the Satara Academic Centers of Excellence Program for providing our division the access to the software. And our collaborators and faculties in El Sherman School of Pharmacy, our collaborators at Qualys Transporter Solutions, our Broward lab members, especially Nathan Pfeiffer and Kyung Hee Yen, who laid the foundation for this work. And um, the funding source from NIH and the UNC was the Society of Fellows. And thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sen, for that excellent and informative presentation. Um, as Sen mentioned, We'd love for our audience members to submit their questions to Chen in the Q&A box. Chen, it looks like our first question from our audience is, we, um, someone wanted to know whether we needed to measure TCA concentration in the blood, bile, and liver to measure clearance. Mm. Uh, that is a great question. Um, so if you would like to estimate the um, biliary clearance, especially the intrinsic biliary clearance, it is important to measure uh, TCA concentration in all the matrices, including uh, liver, bile, and uh, blood. Um, but in, in clinical studies, this is very challenging. So um, that actually highlights uh, some other um, ongoing projects in our group, which is using imaging probes to help us understand the clearance values, uh, especially um, biliary clearance values. And using imaging probes, we can quantify the amount of drug in the liver and in the bile, and also uh, in the blood simultaneously. Okay, looks like we're getting a lot of questions from our audience, that's great. Um, Chen, someone from our audience would like to know, could you describe the difference between cellular unbound concentrations and cytosolic unbound concentrations? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Let me go back to this slide. And the question is around the cellular unbound and the cytosolic unbound question, right? Cellular unbound concentration and the cytosolic unbound concentration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
so in, in this figure, you can see in the hepatocytes, the drugs can bind to intracellular uh, protein um, or sequester into the um, subcellular organelles. Um, so if you, um, when you measure this cellular unbound concentration, you actually uh, measure the cellular total concentration and um, unbound fraction in the cell lysate. And when you um, lyse the whole cell, you actually mix all these things uh, to together. So the um, cellular unbound concentration you're measuring cannot account for the subcellular sequestration, um, which can be um, pretty high for some basic compounds. Uh, while if you're uh, measuring the cytosolic unbound concentration, first you need to isolate the cytosol from the uh, nuclear and the subcellular organelles, and then you measure the unbound fraction in the cytosol only. In this case, you um, are not accounting for drugs sequestered into the subcellular organelles, and that is more accurate. Uh, so usually the unbound fraction measured in the cytosol um, is higher than measured in the whole cell. Um, so that is the major difference. And um, because we need to isolate the cytosol from the, um, from the rest of the cell first, uh, this acid is usually more uh, labor intensive. Um, and um, I actually have a backup slide to show how we did it. First, we need to incubate the hepatocytes with the drug and uh, uh, fractionate the cell without um, disrupting the subcellular organelles so we cannot use something like fornication to lyse the cell. Instead, we pass the um, cell lysate through a syringe multiple times. In this way, the plasma membrane is disrupted by the subcellular organelles or intact. And then we use centrifugation to isolate the cytosol. And then we measure the unbound fraction in the cytosol um, to estimate unbound cytosolic concentration. But if you're interested in um, measuring the unbound cellular concentration, you can put this fraction into equilibrium dialysis and measure the unbound fraction. One of our audience members would like to know, how do you estimate the contribution of each transporter to a specified substrate? Right, uh, that's a great question. Um, it's actually um, very challenging. That's why most of, for most compounds, the relative contribution um, for, for each transporter is unknown. Um, in order to understand the uh, relative contribution, um, the, currently the common practice is you need to um, study the kinetic parameters uh, of a substrate using um, cell lines or membrane vesicles expressing specific transporters to get the uh, Vmax and Km values. And then you will need to measure the protein uh, abundance in hepatocytes for each transporter uh, using um, something like a mass back um, so, so that you can, um, as, so you can scale up the Vmax uh, you measured in transfected cell lines to whole cells. Someone would like to know, do you think using KI unbound, unbound values is advantageous over using IC50 values? That is um, another very good question. Um, currently, um, Many people use IC50 um, in replacement of KI because KI values are more um, difficult to obtain. Uh, more studies will be needed to obtain KI values. Um, but if the IC50 was generated under certain conditions, for example, the um, substrate concentration used to generate IC50 was way below KM value, then it it is fine to use IC50 in replace, um, instead of um, KI. Um, but um, one advantage of using KI value is um, 
if the um, IC50 were generated using a high substrate concentration, uh, then, then it's um, better to use Ki. Another advantage of Ki is when we are generating Ki values, we usually can estimate the mode of inhibition or mechanism of inhibition. And um, this can be important. Um, some work um, by the Dillison group showed that um, non-competitive inhibition against uh, efflux transporters can lead to more extensive accumulation of biacids in hepatocytes compared to competitive inhibition. So knowing the mechanism of inhibition will be um, important. And this information always comes uh, with the KI um, parameter estimation. One of our attendees um, says, if you, if you took the parameters estimated from the in vitro system and you scaled it to an in vivo system and valid, you validated the predictions with observed clinical DDI data, can you comment about any challenges you might have on using the scaling factors? So the question is uh, around in vitro system scale to in vivo system and the challenges um, on the scaling factor. Um, that is a great question. Um, currently, there is no universal scaling factor um, as far as I know. Um, for example, if we um, take the clearance values estimated from the sandwich culture human hepatocyte system and we scale up, usually the uptake um, clearance um, would be underestimated. So a certain scaling factor needs to be applied which is greater than one, usually around 16 to 30. Um, but for biliary clearance, the scaling factor is different. So I, the quick answer is the challenge is that we do not have a universal scaling factor that can apply to all the compounds. We always need to have some prior information to generate the scaling factor first. Someone would like to, for you to comment on why you use the TCA uptake inhibition value of 70% NTCP and 30% OATP1V1. So um, actually for TCA uptake, the relative contribution uh, between um, NTCP and the OATP1V um, is no, although um, there might be some uncertainty around this number. But gen generally, 70% of the uptake is mediated by NTCP and another 30% is mediated by OATP1B. And we use the o o IC50 against OATP1B1 uh, as a representative for OATP1B. As the hepatocyte batches can be variable, what is the degree of variability in your assessment of unbound concentration of drugs in various matrices in different lots of sandwich cultured human hepatocytes? Mm. So for this question, I think it's a very good one as well. I would refer you to um, some previous publications that has uh, looked at the unbound fraction in different uh, hepatocytes, which is not shown in this um, presentation. Uh, for example, one paper was published by Nathan Pfeiffer on DMD in 2013. So he did look at um, the unbound fraction in hepatocytes uh, for um, different compounds. So you can get a sense of that. Um, but um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we can um, touch base afterwards, and I can pull, pull out some literature reference for you. 
do you have experience regarding the cellular binding capacity or linear range for binding for high concentration of drugs? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Someone wants to know, do you have ex experience regarding the cellular binding capacity? I think they want you to speak to what is what is the linear range of binding when you when the the drug when the concentration of drug is high. Mm. So ideally, we should um, measure the unbound fraction uh, at different dose level, like uh, low, medium, high. Um, and in this study, we only have. We only measure the unbound fraction at the dose we used. Um, so I don't, I do not have a, a very good understanding of the um, linear range for these compounds we used um, beyond the concentration we analyzed. Someone says, um, sorry, just give me a sec. Um, do you think, so you, you the, the bile acid that you looked at was TCA. Do you think that other bile acids that are present in human bile will show similar kinetics or do you expect differences? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, it's something we um, we would like to pursue in the future. Um, there's, uh, we certainly believe uh, the kinetic, kinetics could be different for other bile acids because the affinity towards the transporters will be different. And um, that's a, this is a logic next step. And there's a recent paper published on, in, um, I think, European Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, the recent paper, I can refer you to that paper uh, offline. They actually uh, measure the kinetics of various bioacids, uh, comparing the VMAX and the KM. Um, among different biases, and you can see there's a difference. Chen, Chen this looks to be the, the last question from our audience. How do you think that the in vitro model that you developed can guide in vivo studies? Mm. This is a great question. Um, how this in vitro study can guide in vivo studies. Um, I think one, one thing we can apply from this in vitro study is the framework that we proposed. Uh, for example, whether it is uh, necessary to measure unbound concentration in the cell, or can we use uh, the total cellular concentration to make prediction, this framework um, can be applied to design in vivo studies. Um, and, um, and other parts of this framework, um, for example, how to integrate IC50 against different transporters and uh, um, how to predict the net effect um, in the in vitro system, these can all be applied to in vivo studies. Okay, thank you so much, Sen. Before concluding the webinar, 